Good afternoon. Welcome to this week's Inspiring Ideas at Trinity webinar. My name is Anna O'Loughlin and I am part of the Alumni Relations team at Trinity Development and Alumni. This afternoon's webinar will focus on three striking new additions to Trinity's campus with insights from the architects who designed them. We're delighted to welcome architects Valerie Mulvin and Neil McCulloch of McCulloch Mulvin Architects and Wayne Rathwell of Scott Talon Walker Architects. We'll hear about the Long Room Hub on Fellows Square, opened in 2010 by McCulloch Mulvin, home to Trinity's Arts and Humanities Research Institute, the Trinity Business School, opened in 2019 by Scott Talon Walker Architects, a significant example of sustainability that opens out onto Pier Street to help connect Trinity to the local community. And finally, Printing House Square, also by McCulloch Mulvin, which will be Trinity's newest building. Like the Long Room Hub, the building establishes a connection between the historic fabric of campus and the contemporary architecture. Like its new campus neighbour, the Business School, it acts as a gateway between college and the city. Today's webinar is being co-hosted by Dr. Sandra O'Connell, Director of Communications at the Royal Institute of the Architects of Ireland and Vice President of the Trinity Women Graduates Association. Sandra will facilitate the discussions and Q&A following our main talks. Before we start, I would like to run through a few technical items. For those of you joining us on Zoom, if you'd like to view in full screen, you can do so um, by selecting the button on the top right corner. To adjust audio settings, you can select the button on the bottom left corner. To leave the session at any time, you can select the leave button on the bottom right corner. We encourage you to ask questions throughout this webinar. Q&A button um, is located at the bottom of your screen and our speakers will respond to these questions uh, later in the webinar. For those of you viewing on YouTube Live, if you need to unmute or mute the video, you can do so using the small speaker button circled here in red. To share the webinar, click the share link on the right. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the red button. And we'd love to hear from you here too, so please do share your thoughts and questions in the comments box. Our talks today will last around 30 minutes, followed by a 10 minute discussion with our panel, and we'll then open out to an audience Q&A to finish out the webinar that will wrap up at about 2 p.m. Irish time. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. If you're watching on Zoom, you will get a link to the recording shortly. The recording will also be available on the TCD Alumni YouTube channel. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandra O'Connell who will introduce our guest speakers today. Sandra is Director of Communications at the RIAI. She is editor of the RIAI publications, including the forthcoming book, Dublin by Design, Architecture and the City by O'Brien Press. She edited the RIAI's journal Architecture Ireland from 2002 to 2018 and co-wrote and co-presented with Angela Brady the landmark RTE TV series Designing Ireland which featured the architecture of the Trinity College campus and Sandra is currently the Vice President of the Trinity Women Graduates Association. So over to you Sandra. Thank you so much, Anna, for that lovely introduction and a big hello to all the Trinity alumni and other viewers who are watching this webinar today on Innovative Campus Architecture. It's a great pleasure to introduce it. Trinity College campus is a special place for every alumni and we associate the buildings and open spaces with our own personal memories from the long revision hours that we spent in the libraries to great friendships that we formed and many social gatherings. When discussing the campus, it's hard not to mention, of course, the recent TV adaptation of Sally Rooney's Normal People, where fellow Trinity alumni Lenny Abrahamson made the campus a co-star alongside Connell and Marion. Also, when uh, Ireland's Pritzker, Pritzker Prize winners Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara from Grafton Architects filmed their official Pritzker video, they chose the spectacular surroundings of the Long Room Hub in Thomas Burke's old library. As a member of Trinity Women Graduates, I had a the great pleasure of discovering many new campus buildings recently, such as the welcoming alumni room beside the dining hall and the impressive regions room above front gate where we hold our career and networking events, as well as many talks on broad topics from politics to art and social issues. We've also had architecture walls of the campus with Valerie Mulvan, but during the pandemic, we had to move our events online 
such as our Meet the Author book club, where we had live discussions with authors like Hilary Fennell and Colin McCann. Please do check us out on trinitywomengraduates.ie. We're always looking for new members and the funds we raise benefit students who need additional financial support. Trinity is above all a great place to see architecture. In my view, it's the best ensemble of historic and contemporary architecture in Ireland. Over centuries, Trinity College has sought out the best architects, pursued the most innovative building designs of their time and created a multi-award winning campus that continues to innovate for future generations. As you know, the campus has been closed to the public since March of this year, and our webinar is therefore an ideal opportunity to take a virtual stroll through the campus history and architecture and discover some of Trinity's newest buildings. Our first speakers, Valerie Mulvan and Neil McCullough, who studied in Dublin and Rome and founded their practice McCullough Mulvan Architects in 1986, will take us through the brand new printing house square, as well as the long room hub. Situated between the historic printing house completed in 1734 by Richard Castle and busy Pier Street, Printing House Square accommodates 250 student rooms on an iceberg-like landscape of shops, health center and sports facilities. The architects themselves have described the unusual geometry of their building as almost Baroque. The practice works internationally and in Ireland at a range of scales, including cultural buildings, libraries, healthcare, education and residential buildings, with a particular focus on placemaking, context and innovative conservation. Neil and Valerie have also published several books, including the co-written A Lost Tradition, The Nature of Architecture in Ireland and Dublin, and two books by Neil, An Urban History, and Palimpsest Intervention and Change in Irish Architecture. Recent projects of the practice include the Medieval Mile Museum in Kilkenny, shortlisted for the Mies van der Rohe Prize, and the recently opened Butler Gallery in Kilkenny, along with Tapa University in India and the aforementioned Printing House Square, which they will avail unveil for us now. So please welcome now Valerie Mulvan and Neil McCullough. Hi there, Sandra, and hi, hi, hi Sandra. everybody. Hello. You can hi. hear. You can hear us. We just need to share our screen if we can. Yeah. Can everybody see that? Oh, wait, my head thing. Okay. Grand. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start. Um, we're we're delighted to be here and and to talk about um, Trinity projects, and it's it's extraordinary. You don't actually get. Um, opportunities always to talk about things together. So it's it's actually a real pleasure for us to talk about Trinity projects in the one time. Um, I was going to very quickly talk about uh, I ideas in the practice, just, just very shortly, before we start talking about the buildings, the things that animate um, us. This is a, a picture of all the models in the office that a, pa a painter Colin Martin made a couple of years ago, making models, turning them over, to, throwing them away, making new ones. It says architecture is about ideas and um, it's, it's very much about slow time. It's about taking time to think about how you're going to make things. It's seldom about, I'm going to do this now. This is like an immediate thing. It's a slow and thoughtful process. And the things that, um, next, the things that, that I suppose obsess and interest us are essentially nature. Um, uh, looking at the forms of nature, and not only nature, but looking at how the forms of nature grow on nature. How does nature adhere to itself? How do you make something on, uh, on an existing geography? Also about the man-made version of that, about archaeology, about looking into layers, how buildings sit on one layer over, over, over another one. And in terms of the buildings that we've made, th this is one of the buildings in Papar in India, that comes down to talking about geometries, about how do you locate a building in a particular place? How do you arrive at, a, at, at the idea for a design? And in some cases it's to do with new buildings, in some cases to do with existing contexts. In this one, it's a completely open context and the building is very strongly based on, on, on uh, kind of almost ideal geometries of building blocks turning around in relation to each other. Or this building in Watford, which is a fire station, which is like a coil of spring rolling down from a high point down to a low point below it. 
about indented geographies that are in some way an, an, an imitation or a homage to nature. And then that's, uh, as, as Sandra mentioned, that's the Medieval Mayan Museum in Kilkenny. Sometimes geography is about existing buildings and existing places. When you come to make new things in them, you're locating them in a geography of older things. And that's actually what happened in Kilkenny. It was an existing building with new additions made to it. And I completely agree with Sandra. I think Trinity is the greatest ensemble uh, of buildings on the whole island. And it's the most significant um, feature of Dublin. But here's a city like no other, which has a university at the heart of it. And the university is a perfect grid in the middle of all of the kind of complex network of streets around it, an idea of rationality and order in the midst of the complex city. And the particular thing about Trinity, and this is, suppose, this is, this is what you think about when you come to make buildings in it, you're, you're dealing in some way with this grid of buildings or with the edges in the way it relates to the city. And in particular to do with the character of the individual buildings, which are all separate in their sort of individual expression, but have a kind of a communality when you put them together. They have kind of a cheek, a cheek by jowl difference that play off one another in a very, very, very creative way. You can imagine what the campus would be like if all the buildings were exactly the same. It would be much less interesting. And, and yet they're not completely different either. And it's finding a vector into that in the 21st century is actually a very, very, a very interesting way to do it. I was just opened by one small project that we did in, in Trinity years ago. This was making Gallery 2 in the Douglas Hyde, which was basically about opening a door, which would be the, the, the different artists would choose widths on the door that suited them for access and view to their art beyond it. But most of the work that we've been, that we've been doing is essentially to do with ideas about the grid and to do with edges and gates in, into the city. The first building is the hub, which is essentially to do with dealing with the grid. Okay, and I'll, I'll just take up there. Uh, and it, it's, as Neil's saying, the, the whole thing about the context and the site does create one whole strand of things that you, you're, you're considering as you're looking for inspiration about how to add to what is probably the most precious uh, environment we have in Ireland. Um, so the, the thought of adding a new building into that environment is, is really challenging. Um, so you start with, with site and then you also in parallel, you're thinking about the concept. This is a building, a platform for the humanities. Uh, we, we thought about the idea of people working together like a beehive. It's about how, how a collective come together and building on each other's shoulders almost create an idea. Um, we also thought about light and heaviness and, and those kind of opposing ideas. Um, and in, in terms of finding a site, you can see in blue here, this is the, the site for the building. We actually set it over the Edmund Burke Theatre and you can see that there. How we put it in and how we created this environment for it is really what the project was based on. And you can see here, the, the black outline is the building itself and the gray lines underneath the 1937 reading room and the Ed Burke. And this building had to sit between them. It couldn't go down into the Edmund Burke because it would have destroyed people's sight lines. So we designed it like a truss. Um, we also thought about it like St. Jerome's study, that it would be a wooden box which had views out to the landscape that people would kind of think about themselves in terms of their private research, but then the collective of the college itself. So those ideas kind of came together, making an enclosure, bringing light down through it. How do you do that? How do you make a, a, an enclosing wall that, that allows that light to penetrate down? Like test tubes say, which is kind of what the left-hand slide is, is kind of referring to, or the idea of making a tiny little tower that's kind of just almost like an ivory tower, but not a tower that's kind of precious in itself, but has within its walls, lots of spaces for other things. And that's what we tried to explore in this building. But I suppose the most important thing was we were trying to make social spaces that were to do with, with looking at, at how does the building interconnect with its environment inside and out. Very important now in this pandemic time. So our exper experiments with putting people at the junction of the busiest thoroughfare in the college was really critical. Similarly, the section trying to, as I said, the, this, this idea about making these, these uh, series of light cannons that crash through the, the floor plates, they're places for people to gather around and speak and talk and meet together. Or the section cut in the other way where you get the temperature of the building, either, either public um, debate or private research on top supported by the staff. Um, and again, this, this uh, slide here in the dotted lines is just describing where the holes in the building are, where these floor plates intersect and where people gather around 
to talk to each other and then withdraw to, to make their own private research. So it's about a, a building about collective and private and that's a really interesting kind of mix. And the whole thing has to be wrapped in a facade and we thought about looking at the long room, the library itself, that lovely pattern of vertical openings and how could we modernize that? How could we take, take a, a thought about it? And we thought about it like an abacus that we we take that vertical slot, move it around. We we decided to um, make the most uh, important space on the top floor where all the the people had their private research spaces. And you'll see how that then sits underneath the line of the old library. So that was really crucial. Then these light cannons as they swing down. There there are stepped set of voids, which means that people are sitting almost on shelves of rock, looking over at each other. So it's about the community and and the solidarity and the the, the, the aloneness of research based on looking up and seeing your colleagues. And in this case, looking out and seeing a framed view um, or a framed view that is within this timber lined box out to something that you never thought you'd see, like the detail on the dental of the, of the cornice of the library. Um, and then the chaos of, of, of when it's full of people and full of noise and, and, and light and shouting, it's, it's, it's a fantastic environment for that. Um, or when it's quiet, these glass screens, which define some of the uh, areas where we want aural privacy, um, which, which give you these kind of crystalline feelings of these light cannons passing through you. Um, looking at how it fits into the context then, the, the, the vertical uh, slots of the windows then relate to the other buildings in Trinity, the verticality of that, the invitation from the entrance, stairs and a lift that both deliver you to the, to the, to the door, how it sits as a little tower within the context and how these floating planes of stone relate to other floating planes of stone in Trinity. And finally, just how mm. it completes front square with a kind of a, a stone wall behind the block of the 1937. So moving on then to other things, and Neil's going to talk about printing on square and, and just very, pieces. Very quickly go backwards to go forwards because it's just back to this idea about um, entrances and causeways into college. The 21st century link between the university and the city was started with the usher about 20 years ago, but making a way into college, the building like a, a gateway, and also the idea of forming smaller kinds of secondary spaces, which weren't quite like the big courtyards of the university. The site of Printing House Square is, is definitively at the back of college, but it's at the front of a lot of other things. This is the site before we started. It also has, I think, some of the most beautiful architecture in the college, which is slightly out of sight. These wonderful blind elevations by Richard Morrison that date to the White Street Commissioner's opening of Pierce Street in the early 19th century. Um, and the site is actually the last significant site in the historic corner of the college. Um, there's no other kind of major site to build within this. And in a way, the site made itself. And it was to do with, I suppose, making a new entrance to college, which would be in the shape of a courtyard as opposed to just a gate that would lead you in and bring you into the back end of college, opening like the business school, the college back down, out, out and into Pierce Street. And in terms of the, the original competition for it, the key element was to provide this new entrance to college, a welcoming way in for people. And a key element right in the very beginning was the cellular aspect of the student room. How would this be for each individual? How would they appreciate it individually and then in terms of their social existence? And in terms of the character of the building, it was very much derived from its Dublin location. We were looking to make kind of a contemporary vernacular for the way you think about Dublin, very aware of the mountains, the outline of the mountains, but also like a snapshot of the roofs of the city of Dublin, all those sawtooths and gables and, um, uh, and kind of pitches and chimneys. And then very definitely the relationship with the printing house and also with um, uh, uh, Botany Bay, was, was key to the building really relating to protect structures and also to Pier Street, carrying on the, if you like, the exploration, the opening of the street opposite the police station and this wonderful Richard Morrison building, the back of Botany Bay, which as everybody knows is made of wonderful cut stone while the inner facade is made of rubble stone, opening that way down to the docks and carrying on that tradition. Um, working with the, the nature of contemporary buildings, uh, looking at the Barclay in terms of concrete and timber, and thinking about a building that might actually have a different geometry that picked up some of those notions of hills, mountains, natural geography, uh, um, and looking for kind of origins in that. There are some buildings around like that, but not many, and none in Dublin. We were kind of nosing around that idea about making the building almost like a mountain range that would develop its own inner sort of logic 
uh, these are just many examples you go through using uh, 3D printing was a major part of this building to try and understand the geometries. But in the end, making a building that would actually have those forms that would kind of twist around and form a relationship at the back of the printing house with a set of blank gables, we'll show you now, which would actually give it a context like that of a classical temple with no windows onto it, simply a series of, of, of kind of mountain passes and valley walls. Um, set into that sort of relationship where the buildings come in and cant down to the back of it. And in terms of the detail of the plan, it's very much a, a, a gateway open to Pier Street at the top and you come into a courtyard and then down past the printing house. It's intended to be narrow and intended not to be a big wide entrance, but you actually come immediately into the theatre of college. And the first thing you read when you come in is a courtyard, a small, intense social courtyard full of student activity and life. And then you come down and you come through the gate in the wing wall of the printing house. And it's like many other corners of Trinity, it's intended to be tight, like something in Venice, you have to push your way into the college this way. This is a section, as again, as Sandra said, there's, this is a building like an iceberg with student housing sitting on a huge basement, which has a sports center and, um, uh, and a health center down, down, down at the lower levels. The building is made of stone. You can see it here. This is the, 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 the CGI view from the outside, the back elevation, the view down at the, at the side of it, and just some, some views of which will be available very soon, we hope, uh, of, of the building from the street. Looking down and framing this up, that will, it will now become a much more uh, significant view from the side of college in towards the, um, the podium of the Barclay Library. The view from behind the printing house and some views then of the finished courtyard, and you can see this would be quite, uh, quite a tight and interesting dramatic space overlooked by student life, which will have lights, which will have lights across it. There's a garden at the lower level we can talk about later. And this, these are some photographs just from now of the building, just as it's coming out of its wrapping, as, as it were, you can see the kind of nature of the finish on it. This is, this is at the back in the narrows, just, just looking, that's New Square on the left. That's up in the crane, looking down at the corner of the building. Um, just down towards the library. And that's a CGI that we had at the very beginning of the project. And um, that's the reality. It's, it's not totally dissimilar uh, as, as, it, as, it, as it comes out of its wrapping. And that's the view off towards the rest as it starts to take its position as a public building in the city. That's us. So we just hand back to you, Sandra, or to Anna. Thank you. Absolutely. I'm just going to unmute myself there. That was absolutely fascinating. Really great to get your, your insights into how such an unusual design emerges, you know, from, from all these years of practice, from all your time spent on the Trinity campus. Uh, so thank you both very much. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of interesting questions waiting for you. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Wayne Rothwell, an associate director at Scott Talon Walker Architects. Wayne has been project architect on a number of award-winning third level educational and residential projects within the office. He was, for example, the project architect for converting PJ Carroll's cigarette factory in Dundalk, a 20th century icon and protected structure into a modern educational campus. And that project has received numerous awards, including one from the RIAID Sustainability Award and one from the RIBA. Most recently, Wayne has been project architect for the state-of-the-art Trinity Business School located on the other end of the campus. We're now going down to Pierce Street. And uh, it's, a, it's a landmark project. Uh, Trinity College began teaching business or commerce in 1925. Over the last decade, the school has embarked on a high growth strategy when they recognized that a leading university needed a world-class business school. And Trinity College Business School is now in the top 1% of business schools worldwide. So a big ambition for the, for the architecture as well to follow that. And uh, the new building comprises over 12,000 square meters of space for innovative teaching and learning. Um, it also accommodates Trinity's new innovation and entrepreneurship hub tangent. And, but most importantly, the building comes with huge environmental credentials, as Wayne will tell us now. Um, so my talk is going to talk about the three areas, the context, the brief, and the, uh, and the concept. Then we had sustainable design, and then just a quick walk through the building. Next. 
Um, this is a drawing of the campus. The red dot represents the, the site. And you can see that it's um, a link between the science end and the historic core. You can also see in the, um, the drawing shows the relationship, if you look at the historic core, the relationship of the buildings to the, the green areas. And part of the brief was to look at an external space that will connect the building to the rugby pitch. So, and another consideration for the project was to see how we would connect Pier Street to the campus. Next. Um, this is the site itself, a photo of the site. Um, the loose hall, the workshops and the Pier Street, uh, the, or sorry, the Perry building were to be removed or demolished. And then the railway line was our was the difficulty or the, um, in terms of noise. So, and then we have the usual challenges of a tight urban site. Next. This is a view looking along Pier Street under the railway bridge. You can see that this area is in a, a bit of decline and I um, suppose we had to, to see how that could be arrested and how the new building would bring vibrancy, uh, vibrancy to the, the street. Next, please. Next. Hello. Okay. And the building design objectives, we were looking at uh, to create a sense of community, not just within the building for the, but also the local community and further afield. Uh, we were looking to create spaces which uh, cultivated conversation um, and uh, also looked at collaboration and connection. So one of the big ideas issues in the, in the brief was to look at how the building would be able to accept change. So in terms of it being adaptable and flexible, and I'll show you later on uh, the plan, how that's achieved. And then sequence of light, skillful spaces. Um, next. So this is a concept where the building, we have an atrium, and the atrium is the, the gathering space, the organizing space, and we have the teaching um, facilities organized around the atrium. And also, we had to look at the idea of the Agora, which is going to be the left-hand side. And there we were looking at a space which uh, would connect the, the rugby pitch to, to the building itself. And then there was a small, another project where the rejuvenation of the period houses, which were running along Pier Street. And um, that's next, please. Um, so then we had um, a series of user group meetings. And what we realize or what became apparent was that the in-between spaces between your office and your lecture theater were the in-between spaces were where people would just casually meet and these would these meetings would spark conversations and ideas so you can see that the, the floor plates for the building are very wide and um, in the center of the floor plate here you can see there's a, a formal and informal meeting spaces then we have tea stations out to the side and at the top of the helical stairs we have lounge areas. So anywhere we could introduce a meeting space, we did. Next. And this is section through the building. On the left-hand side, we've got the botany. The right-hand side, we've got the railway. We're looking towards Pier Street. And the way the building was organized is that we had the larger lecture theaters um, uh, accessible from the foyer. And then we had the cellular accommodation was looking north and then the teachings um, spaces looking into the atrium and the atrium was bringing air into this um, huge space which in turn was feeding air into into the teaching spaces and then we had set setback for the executive and boardroom on the roof roof level next so this is the this is an elevation of pier street so it's a glazed uh, glazed transparent building and the walls have been replaced with an accessible ramp and generous steps up and there's a gap between the, the glazed box and the gable end of house 188. And this is the entrance area into the, into the business, business school. Next. Um, then the detail on the gable end, we introduced a, a green living wall. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that the, we've got uh, bronze anodized fin walls, which um, I suppose give the, the entrance its, its identity. Um, next. So, Briefly, just to speak about sustainability, in the brief, again, uh, Trinity and the Business School were very much uh, have embraced the, the concept of sustainability and the 17 principles in the United Nations uh, sustainability goals. And 
I often use this diagram here, which is breaks it down into seven principles. And it's not that just energy is considered in isolation, but all these other items like beauty and place and health and wellness, which are very appropriate to, to our current times. Um, so in terms of looking at the building itself, we, we started from the first principles of passive design. So again, maximizing daylight and ventilation. Next. Um, we use um, environmental design tools. So at an early stage, oh, sorry, if you just run on next, please. Yeah, and um, we use environmental design tools. So we analyze the winds, the ventilation, daylight and solar gain. And this verifies our approach or our thinking about a facade. So if you, next slide. And for this particular building, we realized that the um, a twin wall solution was appropriate to the south facing facade at the entrance. Um, so the twin wall consists of an outer skin and then the inner skin, you can just see the, the windows are on, on the inner skin and the outer skin uh, protects the opening windows from wind driven rain and the elements. And underneath you can see the grill where the air passes in and then through the stack effect it rises up and expels at the top of the of the of the, of the glazing up at roof level and um, then sorry uh, you, sorry just back and then obviously between the skins we have the venetian blinds which are used for, for to reduce solar gain into into the rooms themselves next please and um, this is the atrium elevation and um, it's uh, looking onto the botany building and this is a nice photograph because the first two floors you can see the botany building in the reflection in the glass and originally the the solar we had um pre which were just solid elements and because of the adjacency of the botany building it was felt well maybe you know we could look at the idea of planting these and the botany people became very involved in the selecting of the plants for this uh pre next please and this is the, the elevation on the left hand side, you've got an elevation of Pier Street, again, the refurbishment of the houses and the um, shop fronts with the fans. And on the right hand side, um, this is how we um, addressed the noise issue um, associated with the railway line. We had punched windows and within the recesses of these punched windows, we have louvers and these louvers give us uh, there's an L shaped louver. And that gives us the sound attenuation to the offices um, behind. And the picture here on the right shows, um, I suppose it shows the damper for the technical people. And then this is the, the louver itself, the cover, and that's controlled with a switch. Next. And um, this is a diagram which shows some of the sustainable strategies we use in the building. So for example, we have our sedum roofs and our landscaping given us biodiversity and reducing the temperature from solar gain in our cities. We also have the rainwater and um, approach to rainwater in terms of um, recycling, in terms of it, the water goes down to attenuation tank and then it's pumped back up to the WCs. And then we have our PV cells on the roof. And again, because the building, the building is no car parking and is accessible and all the mechanical modes of, vent of ventilation are low energy. So all these strategies are helping us, I suppose, touch a light touch on the environment. And there's credentials on the left hand side. Next, please. Um, so that's just an overview of the sustainability. So now just a quick, um, uh, I suppose, run through the building itself, just showing you some of the spaces. So this is a view from the rugby pitch. You can see that the entrance is set back and there's a few steps up and there's a nice covered canopy over it. So again, this, this again, the entrance would be a meeting place um, where you have shelter. Next. And um, this is the ground floor where um, really what we're trying to do is connect the Pier Street with the campus. So you can walk through these two, two triangular forms at the Pier Street entrance, come through the concourse, through this, the entrance onto the, onto the rugby pitch. And this is a large foyer space where it's multi-use and um, used for exhibitions, events, and can be used by student staff and the general public. So it's again, it's, it's bringing people together. And then you have a generous stairs down to the lower uh, lecture, lecture rooms. Next. Um, one idea we had in the foyer was to try and maximize the sense of space. So we have these um, perforated floating 
uh, rafts and then there's lighting above them and between them to try and just give this sense of space within the within the foyer next please and on the left hand side the atrium you're looking down from the floor floor you can see um how it's been used uh, recently and people walking up to the beach of spiral stairs and on the right hand side again it's back to this idea of connecting with with the surroundings we've got this elegant um steel atrium structure that you're connecting through to you can see the buildings around you mm. next please um, this slide I was trying to show the detailing of, of the atrium facade was we've no secondary structure. So the columns and this crisscrossing of steel is primary and then the glazing is attached to it. So again, this gives an, an elegance to, to the facade and the staircase itself, um, if you, if you ever, get, ever get to use it, uh, it it's, um, has a slight movement in it, which gives you a feel that it's been refined to the nth degree. It's, it's got a nice bit of movement. So next, please. And um, this is the large auditorium. Uh, it's uh, multifunctional in that it's got folding walls, so it can be divided into two. Uh, it's got bleached seating, which can be pushed back. So again, we're trying to keep that idea of adaptability. Um, and then the louvered panels allow the air, air and heating to, to filter into the space. And then this warm air is extracted at high level. Next. Um, this is the first floor, uh, entrepreneur, innovation entrepreneurship floor. This is a, a very creative um, f people in this floor. So we had a huge open, flexible space. Again, folding walls between the two classrooms. And then when you came up off the helical stairs, there was a large reception area. Um, again, and meeting areas in, in, in as well. Okay, um, next please. And then this is just uh, the, the tangent area uh, in use, like the forms taking place at the moment. And to the right hand side, you can see that um, there's a connection there. The windows are connected to the, to the atrium. Next. Um, these are just the breakout spaces um, showing uh, the, the tricell ceiling. And next, please. And the in-between spaces where we've got people meeting um, and then we've got the baffle ceilings over the, the connections between the, the floors. Next. And the fifth floor, again, is where we have the boardroom, flexible uh, folding walls between the classrooms and the exact uh, uh, education facing north. Next. And the, this is a uh, photograph of the boardroom with the floating timber ceiling. And um, this is ha it's basically hiding all the... Uh, the um, AV equipment above it in terms of projectors and screens and also there's um, automated blinds to, to control the environment but this is a was a very important room in the brief and took prominence on the top floor and is connected to the terrace and a large deck area um, and just 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 to note that the donor walls um, at the entrance the campus entrance and just inside the entrance are this was the first building that was, I suppose, built without the use of taxpayers' money, which is important. Next. And some shots of the building at night. This is a shot of the Pier Street with the, the cedar vertical louvers um, giving us a warmth to, to the streetscape. And then on, on the right hand side, this is the campus entrance at night again, um, uh, just illuminated. Uh, and then hopefully in the future when the Perry building is um, demolished. You probably noticed that this would be the Agora, which will connect the, the Trinity Business School itself to the rugby pitch, which I spoke at, at the kind of beginning of the, the presentation. So now, um, sorry, just a quick slot on, that's the re restore, restored, uh, refurbished south elevation of the period houses. And then on the right hand side, we've got the refurbished finance and doorways. And now just a small little video to which it's a drone footage showing you as you approach. Hopefully this will work. So this is approaching the building um, over the botany. You're coming in over the botany building. You can see that there's a variety of um, facade types which gives the, the building a its vitality and interest. Um, you're coming over, you can see the, 
the path to photovoltaics. And then on the north elevation, you can see the punch hole windows. And the apex has got a, a glass, glass structure to it. And you're just pulling out. And this is the entrance itself. Again, we're back into the foyer space. And you can see these louvers provide air into the, into the atrium at low level. And then as you, and the, there's the windows connecting the, the teaching spaces to the atrium. And then as you, <clears throat> we also had an introduced an art wall. And you can see coming in off the helical stairs, we've got these lounge spaces. And uh, again, for people meeting and greeting. And right at the top, we've had the, the roof lights. This is the 600 auditorium where you can link through to the arches um, outside and then the bleacher seating in their folded position. This is the Harvard styled um, seating, uh, particular to Trinity Business School. And this specifically designed um, furniture, which is a kind of turn and learn seating. And this is the boardroom, which shows the floating, again, the floating ceiling and connections to the, build, the city beyond. Um, and then we're just zooming back out to show the, the context uh, that the building is sitting in um, and how it relates to its adjoining buildings. And that's a, that's a very quick snapshot of Trinity Business School. Fantastic, Wayne. Thank you so much. And particularly for that brilliant footage, you know, yeah. that drone footage that we saw in your project. Also those fantastic aerials that Valerie and, and Neil showed in their project. I mean, these, these are views of, of buildings in Trinity that we will never see otherwise. So that that feels very, very special today. And uh, just reflecting very briefly, I mean, we've seen two very different buildings in terms of their, their form and their materiality. However, a lot of commonalities because both buildings are about connectivity, both with the city outside and also with the campus within. Both buildings try and make a sense of place, of, of their location. And both buildings are about achieving a sense of well-being. And so perhaps my first question before we open up to our, our audience here is to you, Neil and Valerie. Um, of course, you designed this building many years ago and well before we had a pandemic, but it seems fortuitous that the building has been designed around a courtyard. It has landscaped gardens and plenty of access to natural light. In your opinion, how does the building support a sense of well-being for its future occupants? Um, I, th I think, Sandra, I, th I would say the whole of Trinity is, um, is, is on common and actually offers an exemplar for the way that people should live out of doors. And I, I don't think it's specific to the building. Printing House Square is, is meant to be an extension of the courtyard sequence in Trinity, and that's the way it's interpreted. So it's just one of many. And um, I, I, I think it, it benefits, I think socially in the way to work with the students, but it benefits particularly for having simply an outdoor space where, um, where students and public will meet. Um, there's a very strong garden theme in it as well, which I think ties into um, other Trinity gardens. I didn't really have time to, to talk about it, but I think that'll add significantly to people's sense of well of well-being as well. We're, we're actually going to create um, a, a, a sort of a, an, what I term an Irish garden, which is full of ferns and plants that you might find around down in the southwest of the country um, in, 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 in a sunken courtyard, which runs right around the courtyard. And it's a continuous green line that's going to act like a wayfinder as well as something to look at in the building, something you come in and you discover as you see it. But I think it's, it's, it's essentially the availability of open space mm. that Trinity excels in. And sorry, can I just add as well, Sandra, I think the other thing that mm. people might be interested in is the way that student housing now is configured. And it's very, um, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because it kind of encapsulates the notion of pods. 
So students, six or eight students in, in Printing House Square will share an apartment. So it's not like a series of single rooms that all people come down to a dining hall and everybody's out in a big long stretch. It's a really important set of clusters. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their own door. They share a common staircase with a number of other apartments. So there's a real sense of communality uh, engendered by, by making smaller groups within which people then can reach out. And I think that's, we tried to do that in the hub as well when we were making reader spaces, that they have small mm -hmm. clusters in which they could could, could get to know people. And then beyond that, we, did, we didn't have to talk about the programme, but beyond that, where visitors were coming, international visitors were coming to research for six months, say, uh, that they get to know a small group and then they're out into the into the wider community. I think that's something is very important for all of us during the pandemic to, to think about how we can make smaller pods work into the bigger community because we as we have to kind of slowly uh, find a way to, to get back to, to work again. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that comprehensive um, answer. And, and Wayne, I'm sure it's very similar for the business school. Obviously, that future space that you showed will be will be a great addition to, to have. But in the meantime, you have integrated things like the living green wall. And maybe you might say something about some of the well-being factors in the building. Yeah, I mean, like what, what, we've taken every opportunity to to connect with nature. So we've got the living walls and the Brice de Lay facing the botanic, uh, sorry, the botany building. And then at the Pierce Street entrance, we've got the living wall. But we've also got uh, the terraces on the setback on the fifth floor. And on the adjacent um, period houses, we've a, a landscaped terrace there as well. So a lot of the west, a lot of the... the the uh, spaces facing west are looking down onto that terrace. So the, all these mm -hmm. all these ideas of connecting with nature are, are very important to somebody's well-being, and and that's something we're 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 always focused on. Can I ask you the three of you? Um, but again, we maybe start with Valerie and Neil. Do you have a favorite favorite space in in the building? Gosh, um, in in the. <laughs> hub I suppose where one of my favorite spaces is when you you've arrived up at the top you're in one of those light cannons and you're looking out back yeah. over from the square and it's kind of at a corner junction and you've just got a window you've got this mm. tremendous view of the of the long room the library itself and you're right up close to the detail of that and it's a really <clears throat> uh, fantastic a piece of of city that you feel you're in so I suppose the the thing I find is most enjoyable is that you're in you're really within these fantastic historic buildings and the, and the materiality of them is, is so immediately yes. available to you. And I, I think in Printing House Square, I, I always think of Trinity as like, a, it's a place where people are walking along and talking, like right? They're talking mm -hmm. about a subject, some academic subject or gossip or friendship or something, but it's a sequence of spaces that you walk through and they're narrow, they're wide, they've got trees in them, they're just, they're, they're just made of brick. And I think, I think the thing in the Printing House that uh, I would I think is, is, is my favorite is the sequence of space from the entrance, that you'll have a big gate off from Pier Street. You come into a low space, suddenly you come into a space, you see a courtyard on the side, suddenly the printing house comes into view, you see a garden in front of it, then you see a small door, you go through that. Um, it should be, a, it should be a, 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 a pretty vivid experience that's kind of part of the, the Trinity tradition. Fantastic. And Wayne, what about you? What's your favourite space in the Trinity um, Business School? Uh, yeah, str strangely, um, it's probably one of the small office spaces, which is looking out onto the, the landscaped uh, area um, just behind the, the period houses. But I tend to agree with Neil that uh, it's really the, it's, it's the sequence of spaces and walking through a building that you really get your vitality from and it's different volumes and different textures so like you're coming into maybe a, a low uh, the foyer area which is quite a, a wide and um, doesn't have much height to it but then you're going into a double height space um, in the auditoriums then you're going up through the helical stairs you're into a lounge and then you're into an intimate space just off the lounge and then you're back into a, an open space so it's it's the getting variety into into the for different types of spaces is critical to to someone's experience and enjoyment of a building, and uh, the jump the, the the way the Trinity Business School was was the layout and and the, the site geometry, even though it was awkward, yet yeah, those in between spaces um, they're there to be to be uh, to be experienced. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Um, we've got some audience questions here and I might stay with you, Wayne, because there's one here from Cecil and he's just wondering, um, the business school looks a little bit noisy in the public spaces with the hard surfaces. How did you deal with, with noise? Are there acoustic tricks sort of integrated yeah, into yeah, the building? Yeah, it's been, fabric? we, we, ha we have, um, if you looked at the, yeah. the, uh, the ceiling, uh, there's an acoustic absorption in the ceiling. Um, mm -hmm. So that's and it's been and there are acoustic panels obviously within the on the on the teaching side. So the acoustics has been looked at in terms of this, within the teaching spaces themselves and within the auditorium. So yes, we've had a, a our acoustic consultant look at it very closely. Okay, thank you. And we're going to stay with the um, the topic I think again of. Um, health, health and well-being. There was a question just where you both see the campus evolve in future. I mean, you've both explained really well how you've integrated health and well-being being into your buildings. But do you see this continue as a strong theme into the future, into the campus? Is there more to be done? What could be done? I think it, well, there's always more to be done. But I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. The great thing about Trinity is that it breaks down into into series of spaces and the serial experience, mm -hmm. of that, as, as, as people have said, is is kind of critical to your understanding and your enjoyment of the spaces. But that also facilitates the possibility of people uh, making small groupings together. So, for example, in in Fellows Square, you know, there, there are deliberate places where you stop. And, and you kind of have a chat with somebody. Um, and those are generally outdoor spaces. I think that's gonna be one of the big strengths for Trinity in the future. Uh, as I think mm. Neil was saying at one point that, you know, the, the checkerboard of spaces, which are all open and yet contained, mm. they give you that sense of, of, of being in a place and yet we are safe out in the open yeah. air. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, yeah. big, that's gonna be a big feature. I'd, I'd, I'd say maybe just if, if, if you think about it in the uh, West End of Trinity, which is, which, which is fairly built up, some of the future might be underground. You know, it, 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 it might be in excavating squares and making kind of spaces under. And it, it'd be very important in, in thinking about those uh, to think about nature and light and how they add to the sequence of spaces. And also Trinity is expanding well beyond the boundaries of the original campus. And that it should be aware as it is, that as it exp expands, it brings the character the best of the character of the existing campus with it to what they're going mm. to do. It's such a strong thing about the college. And, and, and it, it really is, it, it's a good lesson for, for, for any work of architecture that it should be imbued in all the new work they do elsewhere. And I, I'd just love to add and just one tiny other point, which is about kind of outdoor spaces and furniture because the urban mm -hmm. furniture that, that we have in places, and you know, not just kind of picnic table kind of things which do pop up all over the place, mm -hmm. but the idea of people beginning to use steps and walls and ledges and to begin to incorporate those into the architecture that we're making, it's often hard to argue with clients for, for the money to spend on those things. Mm -hmm. And they're so important, particularly now, where you can socially be distant and yet you're part of a community. And that's mm -hmm. such a great thing to be able to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think you both also showed uh, in your presentations that sometimes you have to demolish something to make space for something new. And there's a question here about Loose Hall, which is directed at Wayne, because that, that seems to have been a favorite building of a lot of students. You know, it was a sports center first, then it became a student hangout. And uh, a lot of people seem to miss it off the campus. Uh, Wayne, why did Loose Hall have to be demolished? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a building very dear to our heart. It was it was built in the nineteen seventies by our practice here, and um, I played I played squash in it myself a few times, and I loved the building. And um, um, yeah, I mean, it was I suppose it's part of the strategy, the pressures that come on 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 a, on a campus environment where they look at where is opportunities for development and change, and. Uh, I suppose it had come to its end of its of its of its life as well. So um, yes, that hard call was made, and um, was made at maybe a, at a high a high level in, in the Trinity themselves. But um, yes, it's a it's it's a building missed by ourselves. You know, if I could say I, I can catch the ball for Wayne on that one. <laughs> there, are, there are sports facilities coming in Printing House Square that I think <laughs> will actually. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so, I know there was a there's some sporting facilities in the Cran Institute next yeah. door as well. So I mean, I suppose they're they are being replaced. I mean, Trinity without sports, yeah, couldn't, you couldn't dream of it. 
I think you have a squash court in the basement, if I remember correctly, from a er very early site visit. We have we have several, which will, which uh, with, with with partitions that can be taken away to make a great party space. Actually. Wow! <laughs> Don't mention <laughs> party at the moment. <laughs> Yes. And, and Wayne, uh, Robert here mentions also the future demolition of the Simon Perry building. Yeah. Was this part of the design brief or is yeah, this Yeah, yeah. I, I got caught at the beginning of the presentation there, but I was trying to explain that um, on the slide that I show uh, of the photograph, the, uh, the, the intention was that the Simon Perry would be removed and that we'd have an agora space there, so an outdoor kind of seating and hanging out space. And that will connect the building to the rugby pitch area. And mm -hmm. that was very important to the concept of the building. So when you look at the building at the moment, you can see that it's kind of the entrance is squeezed between the botany and the peri. Um, so hopefully the peri might move um, in the near future. And then it will give a space for, the, for our building to breathe, you know, because it's, it's just it's not, there's enough air around it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Neil, you, you started the presentation with a, a photograph of ferns and moss and woodlands. And we actually have a question here from Hugh McGuire, who's asking, you know, the sunken areas, they're lovely details, but how will the space function in a damp, moss-encouraging Dublin environment? Well, I, I hope a damp, uh, the, the kind of moss-encouraging Dublin environment is exactly what we want. That's, uh, that's, 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 that's exactly what it's about. It's a... It's a um, yeah. Having having visited moss gardens, uh, I've, I've always thought that that there there are great gardens to make in Ireland that haven't yet been made with with, with the plants and the climate that we have. So it's it's to some to some extent it's it's playing with that idea, and 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 trying to find that right level of of, of, of damp and light for those plants to thrive. So um, I I think that's a plus, not a minus. Thank you. I think we may have time for one more question, if I'm right. And there's congratulations here from Trevor Pair to Valerie on her election to Estona. So congratulations. That's fantastic news. Uh, and the two, he says the two Macaulay Mul Mulvin buildings are mostly aimed at art students. Apart from the obvious need for laboratories, is there any distinction between a building for arts activities and one for scientists? That's a really great question. That's a great question. I think, yeah. I think no is the first answer um, because you know mm -hmm. you have very specific spaces which are to do with with how the uh, the disciplines are, are are taught or imparted, how people learn how to dissect the eye of a bull or something are are quite specific spaces. But the spaces around those are still going to be the spaces where people gather and meet. People don't change. That what they want to do is the changeability factor. So I suppose mm -hmm. the idea that you get. Uh, small little um, cl clusters of, of spaces or maybe quite large laboratories which which coalesce together and create mm. a scientific environment yeah. but you've still got to come out and and, and yeah. find nature and, and be yeah. part of that. I, th I, th I think breaking down that distinction mm. would be really interesting it's, actually. It's, it's very important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well look there's a final comment here from Brian Arnold who says Wayne your roof garden overlooking the rugby pitch is truly magnificent with amazing view. So that's a lovely right. way to close out. I that's would great. like to Thanks. thank our speakers today who gave so much of their time and you know really showed us how these buildings come about, you know, all the, 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 the thought and, and work that goes into them. And they are there for everybody to enjoy. And hopefully when the campus opens again, uh, we can all frequent ourselves with it again. So my big thank you to you all and thank you to Trinity alumni for hosting a talk on architecture. So much, Sandra, and uh, a sincere thank you to Valerie, Neil and Wayne as well for your time today. It's been absolutely wonderful to have you with us and to hear the process of designing spaces that are permanently part of both of Trinity's history and its future. So thank you so much. I'd also like to say thank you to all of our team here at Trinity Development and Alumni who have been working in the background to make these webinars possible, especially to Alexandra Owens behind the scenes today. So I'll just share my screen with you one final time and um, just if you'd like any more information uh, about the work of both McCulloch Mulvin and Scott Tallon Walker, as well as the ORIAI, uh, their websites are on screen for you there. If you'd like to learn about the Trinity Women Graduates Affinity Group, you can visit Trinity Women Graduates at, T at sorry, Trinity Women Graduates.ie. 
And finally, if you have any questions or comments regarding the webinar series, please email us at alumni at tcd.ie. Our next webinar in the Inspiring Ideas at Trinity series will take place on Wednesday, 28th of October at 8 p.m. Irish time. The webinar is titled Educating Future Innovators and will feature adjunct professor of Stanford University's Design School, Stuart Coulson, CEO of, Trini of Tangent Trinity's Ideas Workspace, Ken Finnegan, and Executive Director of Stanford University's Design School, Sarah Stein Greenberg. The registration link will be sent out by email shortly, so do keep an eye on your inboxes. We hope to welcome you next time. In the meantime, thank you once again for joining us and stay safe.